good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, event uh, jointly sponsored by Bay Atlantic University and the Global Policy Institute. My name is Paolo von Schirach, and I serve as the chair of political science and international relations at Bay Atlantic University. And it's also my privilege to be the president of the Global Policy Institute, a research outfit uh, closely associated with Bay Atlantic University. As you all know, today uh, we are here to listen to really you know, very, very uh, accomplished professionals in the field of immigration. Uh, at a time in which uh, this theme resonates uh, for, for wh whatever reasons, and we'll ascertain them, you know, in, in, multiple, fa in multiple ways. Um, so we are looking forward to be enlightened by those who really understand the nuts and bolts of this uh, phenomenon as it's uh, you know, unfolding, uh, and hopefully be a little bit more enlightened in our understanding of what's going on. On a preliminary basis, obviously, everybody knows that America, and it's a, it's a old, but nonetheless, absolutely true cliche. This is a country of immigrants. Uh, uh, except for the Native Americans who were here when, when, uh, when the European uh, started colonizing the United States and, and unfortunately their fortunes have been affected mostly not in a good way uh, you know, by the encounter with the Europeans arriving, but fundamentally the country has been populated at the beginning mostly by European immigrants and later on, you know, going closer to our times, by immigrants uh, from all over, um, and um, in particular, in closer decades, uh, from Central America or Latin America, we know we have a you know a, a long and important border on the south with Mexico, uh, of course, another border on the north with the Canada, but that's not the source of most of our immigration and then people coming from everywhere from Africa from Asia from from uh, from Polynesia you know you name it and so the 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 picture has become uh, more and more complex and uh, uh, obviously the United States has laws statutes that supposedly regulate and and determine uh, who can or cannot come here or those who can under what circumstances, and what sort of eligibility criteria <clears throat> there may be in terms of work, in terms of background, education. Uh, some come here by lottery, <laughs> many. Uh, um, you know, that's not the majority, obviously, it's a small number. But th that tells you how complex this uh, scenario is. The reality is, and, and we'll come to our guests in, in, in a second, the reality is that right now uh, we are facing a, a difficult situation on our southern border because of the efforts by so many individuals and with different backgrounds and, and our guests will, our experts will explain that, who are trying to come to the United States. Many of them without documentation, or, you know, now it's the preferred way of saying it, illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants, you take your pick. But in any event, they're trying to get in without there being a system or a proper process to welcome them. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that while efforts have been made here in Washington in, in the past to update our immigration laws, no progress has been made. To the best of my recollection, the Simpson-Mazzoli Act of 1986 was the last time in which there was really a comprehensive bipartisan effort here in Washington to uh, enact new immigration legislation. To the best of my knowledge, again, and my guest may correct me, in 2007, there was a bipartisan effort in the US Senate to, to really do something about immigration, in particular, to create a, a path for legalization of all those who are here already, not but with, with no legal status. That effort was bipartisan, and it seemed to have some traction, but it was torpedoed by the Republicans in the House of Representatives. And that was that. To my knowledge, there hasn't been anything uh, really of, of substance except for 
President Obama's effort to try to, by presidential authority, not, not congressional mandate, to give a path to legalization to the so-called dreamers. But I don't want to get, you know, <laughs> too far uh, onto this. Uh, the, the floor is now for to our guests. You've received the, their bios in the um, invitation sent to all of you, so I'll dispense with them. And I, why don't we just uh, start with some preliminary observations uh, by each of you. Uh, Elizabeth, why don't we start with you, since I see you on my left uh, corner mm -hmm. on my screen. Thank you. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I um, practice immigration law, and so our, I work in a small law firm, and we provide legal services, immigration legal services, to um, individuals, primarily families, um, some companies. And I've been doing this since um, 2003, so uh, it, it's been a while, and I've seen uh, several different administrations and the way you know their approach to immigration, and also um, you know, it, um, lived through some of those, uh, you know, the failed attempt that you mentioned in 2007. And, um, you know, so it's, it is interesting. I think, um, you know, what we see as practitioners primarily is um, to some degree, you know, that there's, there's much less change in terms of the law itself um, and, and the statutes and the things like that that affect our clients, those, you know, as you mentioned, there hasn't been a lot of, of change in those and those have stayed pretty steady and, and even more so, you know, in the past decade as we've seen these stalemates with Congress and the really, you know, partisan nature of things and, and um, how difficult it is to get things passed. And so um, what we see more are sort of the policy um, changes and the different um, attitudes towards enforcement policy and to uh, trying to um, create opportunities, um, you know, depending on the administration, either, you know, trying to emphasize enforcement as much as possible and um, dissuade asylum seekers and things like that, as, as we saw in the past administration, and then the use of policy to try to create opportunities, you know, for other administrations, like, like we're seeing with this one and, and in the Obama administration with, as you mentioned, the, the DACA uh, program, you know, th those type of things um, in terms of, you know, the the day-to-day, effect on our clients and, and, and immigrants and what they're eligible for and the directions that their cases may take, um, it, definitely much more of, a, of an effect um, than, than the law. All right, uh, Tatiana, to you, please. Give us a sense of, uh, of uh, what, by the way, also tell us uh, what you do and also it's my understanding mm -hmm. that you are engaged in some activities uh, productively with our university. So maybe you can expand on that too. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for giving us a space to, to participate. Uh, and it's funny you mentioned 2007 because in 2005 or six, um, I think it was 2006, uh, I was back in Houston completing my undergraduate degree and we started um, organizing the youth uh, to the, not the, demand for the passage of the DREAM Act back when um, Obama and McCain were working collaboratively to pass uh, a legalization path for undocumented um, students. So my work in the immigration activist field <laughs> goes back to goes back to then and we fast forward to today and I'm, I work with Samu First Response and we are in a nonprofit organization our headquarters are in Seville, Spain, uh, and then we have over 50 centers that house uh, unaccompanied minors. So for the past six months, we've been here um, in DC working on expanding our centers into the US to provide the services that have worked very well for us. Um, the model that uh, is focused on 
the integration of the youth with into society so they can become um, you know functioning and functioning members of society and have an, an a successful uh, path to integration. And uh, we've been uh, lucky enough to find uh, Bay Atlantic University and partnered with you guys um, as we try to open a, our first uh, youth center here in Washington, DC. So uh, it's been great to have the support of uh, you know your team and you know have friendly faces that are with common objectives you know so that's what we've been doing uh, for now okay. as of policy um, it's interesting uh, you know we were promised a lot of things during the campaign and it's now it's time for action now it's time to for accountability and uh, it doesn't seem optimistic but you know maybe little by little I'm I have been seeing a uh, little more positive steps taken by the Biden administration and uh, the light, the latest um, announcement from the from Mallorca's offices. They're a little hopeful in that regard. All right, many thanks. And uh, to you, Ernesto, professor, I should uh, say, and I discovered that neighbor uh, <laughs> of mine, uh, just a purely by accident at, at American University, since I live in the neighborhood. Ernesto, over to you. Give us your sense of where things are and what you're doing you know, in terms of your work and research uh, about these matters. Thank you, Paolo, and thank you the GPI and uh, Bay Atlantic University for the invitation. It's a pleasure to share the panel with my colleagues. Uh, I am an immigration scholar. I am the director of the Immigration Lab, and I have written around seven books, all having to do with international migration. And what I wanna uh, say today is a, a couple of things in terms of how we think about immigration and policymaking being here in Washington. Uh, there's three, three time periods or three points in this process that we have to think about. So the first one is the people that are already here and are undocumented, around 10 million people uh, who have no rights, who fear deportation, but uh, pay taxes, have children here who are citizens, contribute to our economy, have integrated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have a debt to them that for a long time uh, we've been trying to fix. And, and I think reconciliation is the time and place to do it. Uh, public opinion for of everybody, independents, Republicans, and Democrats is in favor of doing this. That would include uh, the dreamers, people with TPS, uh, but also workers that kept us fed uh, during COVID, uh, working in the fields, delivering food, preparing food, Etc. So that's uh, one set of population. A lot of individuals, but very small for the size of the US population, 10 million. Then we have uh, the people arriving at our doors, uh, like the Haitians uh, recently, people from Central America, people from Afghanistan, and most also most people mm -hmm. in public opinion are in favor of us giving them a home, given all the help they provided in Afghanistan, as we have done with Iraqis, Vietnamese, and others in the past. And that's what is often in the in the media about the quote unquote crisis in the border, which I wouldn't call it so because it's only a crisis in the border temporarily. And because as Paolo was saying correctly, there is not uh, a rational uh, working way for them to come in, in a more orderly fashion. Uh, but we can fix that. Uh, the Congress can fix that relatively easily. So that's the second conversation. And then the third one, which is often uh, overtaken by the other two also very pressing issues is what to do with future immigrants that wanna come five, 10 years from now. That was a big problem of the um, Samson Mazzoli legislation of 1986 that was mentioned, uh, but Paolo, it gave an amnesty for people breaking uh, um, civil law, immigration law, and they were able to regularize paying a fee in English. And they were very successful members of society and they have contributed all the people that benefited for that, from that uh, amnesty. It's not a bad word. I think we should, we should do it again. But the problem with that law is that it put a lot of money on uh, enforcing, uh, policing the border, in persecuting people, in, in reducing the amount of ways that people could come, and supposedly penalizing employers for hiring undocumented workers, which incentivized a lot of uh, fake documents and processes well, the fact that there was an open door for Mexican labor could come and meet the demand in labor. So it was working really well until um, I will say 
So a couple of things happened that I want the audience to think about, and I'll finish that uh, my intervention now with that. So we had a crisis of 2008 that decreased unemployment and provided economic pain for all Americans. That resulted in a decline of immigration from Mexico because there were not many jobs anymore. Also, we see demographic changes in Mexico and a growth of the middle class. So since 2008, we see a need zero immigration of Mexicans, which were the number one labor force, not the only one, but the number one unskilled labor force migration. We also had uh, over half a million people deported by the Obama administration. Then we have the draconic policies of the Trump administration, which ended up uh, banning um, a lot of Muslim immigrants who are coming, uh, building more, more miles of the wall, disincentivizing a lot of people for coming. And then with the pandemic, uh, a, a real closure of borders and airports because of a real pandemic concern, but also then the establishment of Title 42, which closed the borders with the excuse of the pandemic and travelers from Canada and Mexico to this day cannot come, that may change soon. But what that resulted is that there has been a, a effective closure of the border for over a year now and a decline of immigration in the last years at the same time than three quarters of a million Americans have died. So for the first time in over a hundred years, we have seen a decrease in migration accompanied by a decrease in the population of the US as uh, documented in the last US census. So it's in the interest of all of us that live in the United States to invite and make sure that we have a lot of new immigrants so we can have a strong economic recovery and that so can people can fill all the jobs uh, vacant uh, in DC and around the nation. So also we have to be pragmatic and think about it and congressman and reconciliation will be the way to do it because we don't have the support from Republicans at this point. But thank you very much. It's a very good, uh, thorough, comprehensive analysis. Let's start. You know, there's so much to discuss here, and I don't know exactly what the best way of approaching this complicated problem is. But let's ask. Let's ask from here. Um, let's start from here. I should say, what do you think is possible, uh, realistically, not ideally? What you, what we should do, and I'm sure there are lots of good ideas of what we should do. But given the highly um, partisan environment here in Washington, D.C., uh, what do you think, all of you, uh, may be realistic to expect? The Biden administration is now approaching sort of the end of its first year. There's three more years of Biden. We're going to have midterm elections next year. The Republicans may take, if, if history is any guidance, may take control of one or both houses of Congress. That's usually what happens in midterm elections. The part of the president loses seats. Uh, given this political environment, which is also extremely acrimonious and where immigration is an extremely emotional issue, not examined on its merit, but on its symbolism, you know, and its crazy ideas or other things, what do you think may be realistic? Is it, are we going to see any new legislation, uh, anything at all, which could address the dreamers, which could address, uh, you know, the ten or twelve or whatever millions of people estimated? You say ten, some, you know, whatever the number is, of the undocumented immigrants that are already here, and that some of them been here for decades, and whose status has not been. Um, you know, adjusted, which I think it's really, really awful that this country does this, that, you know, you, you condemn people to live in the, this kind of no man's land, you know, of one step away from deportation. Uh, and yet some of them have been here for decades. So these are issues, but also going forward, is there a chance of any reform in terms of the cri eligibility criteria? for immigration. We know, for instance, and you can elaborate on that, say Canada, Australia have the point system, right? You know, to, to assess the credentials, if you wish, of a potential immigrant. So let's start with this, uh, uh, Elizabeth. Do you see any chance at all of any modification uh, in the legislation that governs immigration, or is it gonna be all by, done by executive order by the president or modifying or tweaking enforcement? How, how do you see all this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would like 
to be hopeful that there would be some change. I feel like I sort of, you know, owe it to all my clients who always ask me and, and you know, are hopeful themselves. Um, and, and granted, I'm, you know, I, I'm kind of indirectly involved with policy, you know, through our professional association, we try to, you know, keep up with things and, and support um, the legislation that's been proposed um, that would be helpful. Um, but, you know, I, I just kind of based on um, the current situation and, um, you know, the lack of any real legislative change um, that we've seen over the past few years, I, I don't, uh, I, I certainly don't encourage my clients to rely on that happening. Um, I think, you know, um, uh, Ernesto mentioned the um, reconciliation. I think, you know, maybe that's something that's um, realistic to hope for, some changes coming out of that. Um, but I think we're more likely to see um, uh, opportunities coming through uh, policy changes and, and um, you know, potentially uh, the, um, a, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, what's decided by the Board of Immigration Appeals, um, which is uh, a lot of the um, agencies that do have an effect, you know, that whose decisions do have an effect on on immigrants and our clients um, are within the executive branch. And so, you know, some of the decisions that we'll see coming out of, of the Board of Immigration Appeals and the Department of Labor, um, those might uh, be areas where we see some change and some opportunity as opposed to Congress itself. Is that, I mean, do, do you think that the hardships, given, given this uh, realistic scenario that you are painting, do you think that the hardships, and we know there are many, that the would-be immigrants uh, or whoever is trying to come through, whatever the means, mm -hmm. just trying to sneak through the border, asylum seekers, unaccompanied children, whatever they may be, mm -hmm. do you see their plight being ameliorated somehow, including, you know, bread and butter issues like providing sh appropriate shelter and, you know, food and medicine and what have you at the border, right when they get there. We've heard horror stories of, of people really being accommodated in, in pretty terrible conditions because the facilities are overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Do you see any, even at this, uh, let's call it tactical level, you know, at this day-to-day uh, -day, management level, is that getting any better? Do you see any responsiveness uh, from whether it's Homeland Security or whoever is there, the Border Patrol, is that get, gonna get any better or, is, or are we gonna be in this sort of perpetual semi-crisis mode at the border? Elizabeth. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, we'll have to see. I know that, um, you know, one of the big uh, programs that was implemented by the prior administration, the, you know, I think they called it the migrant protection protocols, kind of colloquial known as the, the remain in Mexico, um, was kind of, um, one of the most extreme and, um, you know, what most advocates felt, um, you know, led to uh, just a lot of, uh, human rights abuses and things that people felt were really kind of against the, the sort of moral fiber of, of the nation um, and, you know, our country in terms of being, you know, a refuge and a, and a, a place where immigrants are welcome. Um, that, um, that is kind of in a, in a period of, of legal challenge and limbo right now is my understanding. And the um, Biden administration tried to end that policy and they were um, prevented from doing that by a federal court in Texas. And, and then um, the Supreme Court uh, failed to um, you know, put a stay on that. And so, so right now, my understanding is that that program is still in effect, but they're still looking at ways to end it. And I think, um, you know, they're, they're, um, those efforts will probably 
have a lot of um, effect on what, what you were mentioning in terms of the, the initial um, experience that people arriving at the border um, will have. But then also, you know, Ernesto mentioned the, the Title 42, and I think that's very problematic currently as well, um, you know, in terms of the way people are, are being uh, prevented from from entering, you know, even even to seek asylum because that's in place. And I, I think, um, you know, particularly with I think recently in the news, a large group of Haitians who, um, you know, have been arriving at the border with all the, uh, you know, horrible things that have, have happened there, um, and and uh, advocates have been very disappointed with the current administration's, you know, continuous use of that. Um, okay, Tatiana, what's your what's your take on what what may be possible realistically in in terms of the policy environment? Do you see any any changes, or or is this pretty much things will stay as they are? So, so like Elizabeth, I also want to be hopeful. I mean, we've been waiting for a change for many many years. Mm -hmm. um, two things: I I do see that there are louder voices on the Democrat party. They're not gonna stand by and be quiet if the mainstream uh, vision of the party does not pro uh, deliver what, what promised. So I think that would give a little room for change to happen, at least for the dreamers. Um, again, I'm very, I'm, I, I wanna be hopeful. Uh, I do see that, um, that the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the administration is taking, is taking its time to look at the, at the causes, is not making any immediate changes, but when the changes um, are coming around, uh, they seem to be guided in the right direction. Um, Secretary Mallorca's issued a statement yesterday saying that the um, at work rates will stop which um, again, it's, a, it's one step in the right direction. It doesn't provide legalization, but at least people um, would not be fearful of going into, the, into, into a, fa a factory job. And uh, you know, with the uncertainty of any time ICE is gonna come, uh, we're gonna have a raid and I'm gonna be deported. So that might not be huge, but it's a little step. Another thing that we've seen, and again, when we started looking at a possibility of opening our centers here in the US, uh, we started talking, our first step was trying to understand the system, trying to understand how undocumented uh, children were placed in the different shelters. So we talked to groups in Houston that were advocating uh, for a safe environment, especially there was a big um, housing, big facility that was housing 500 girls uh, in precarious conditions. So they were working on uh, demanding its closure and having the right, uh, the right setting for these youth. And um, it worked. They were able to, to have the, the standards of the shelter reevaluated. And um, I don't know up to today where they are. Uh, we've also known that, um, for example, the big shelter in um, El Paso for Bliss is now partnering with uh, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Centers uh, services, and they are providing services at the base, which again, it's a step in the right direction because they're one of the nine providers for, for the Office of Refugee and Resettlement. So they know how to work with the children. They know what the conditions that the standards are. Um, so little by little, when we, uh, when we were trying to see how we could partner with the government, we also learned that the Biden administration had uh, changed the way the grant approval was going for new centers. So instead of just picking, a, just soliciting uh, or opening an, an RFP to get uh, different bids, they actually wanted to make a, a first um, a first filter 
of those organizations presenting for granting. So they uh, they partner with an association that deals with uh, children and refugee centers uh, worldwide, and they are providing technical assistance for organizations like us who are trying to open centers for migrants. Um, so they are providing us with the tools and with all the legislation and, and all the methodology that we need to take in, to have in place to have the right settings for this youth that are crossing over. So ideally, um, and it, it looks very nice on paper, if the flow works, then the children would only, or yeah, the unaccompanied minors will only be in custody of border patrol for about 72 hours while they get placement. So um, to see that the, that the push is to move on the right direction and that they're right now working on more of a prevention mode versus reaction, which has been the opposite, um, it's again hopeful. So they're investing in having enough beds across the country to be able to accommodate the next surge of unaccompanied minors. So, you know, we'll see. All right, Ernesto, uh, to you also, we have a question from our audience, uh, you know, which is, speaks obviously broadly to, to the same issues. Regarding the surge of, of, of immigrants or would-be immigrants crossing the famous Rio Grande, the question is, I mean, can the administration, has the administration the, the resources in place to handle this? 200,000 people trying to come through what can, and of course, I remember uh, Vice President Harris saying, don't come, right? That was her message to Central America or other places, say, please don't come because uh, you're not, you know, we, we cannot welcome you because you haven't gone through that process, which makes perfect sense in principle. But also, as we know, you know, people say, hey, Biden is president, he's going to be nice, he's not going to be Trump anymore. Why don't we just try this one? Because they'll, you know, sooner or later we'll find a way to get through. What's your take on this? In other words, we got this surge, all these people trying to come through. There's an issue of processing, you know, but also what are you going to do with all these people? Are they, do they have, based on current statutes, eligibility criteria? Some are asylum seekers, which is a separate category, I guess. Most of them are not. So how do you see this? Is this kind of a, an, an, a never-ending crisis there? Or is there a way to regularize this, uh, this uh, flow uh, and understanding that America remains a magnet for people who are trying to find a better life? We understand that, what the pull factor is. But how do you view this? Thank you for the question, Telman. I understand the question, and this is the, this is the way that the media frames it a lot uh, and pundits on, on TV. And, and it makes sense, but just as an academic, looking at it at the larger context internationally and historically, I think the, the first false assumption is to think that we can manage immigration or that we have ever managed immigration historically. Uh, North Korea, um, uh, Eastern Germany was very good at, at not letting people get out. Uh, a few totalitarian regimes have been almost successful, fully controlling immigration, but no liberal democracy is able to 100% control the movement of people in a, in a, in a system of, of human rights. So, so that's the first kind of false assumption that, that those figures at all an, an all-time high the Border Patrol agents sometimes make these um, headlines because they want more resources. But uh, it's false because uh, we know that there are 200. What, how, how are these numbers coming from? And these are coming from interactions with either Border Patrol agents or immigration agents uh, at, at the port of entry or along the, the, particularly the southern border. So it means that people are trying to ask for a legal way to come in. They are not trying to hide in the middle of the night for the most part. With the Biden administration, many of them were trying to ask for asylum, which is part of the international law. Because of Title 42, the US has been able to avoid satisfying at least hearing some of the cases and see if they have legal uh, avenues to merit uh, asylum or not, given the current statutes. But let's remember that in the 1800s, uh, in the 1950s, uh, for a long time when Mexican migration was big, 
and most people pass on the take that are unannounced and they were not turning themselves into the authorities. So that was what we not only understand as illegal immigration, which means not entering outside of a port of entry. And uh, that is not what we see right now. So we can measure people better, but in terms of the people that came, it was higher in previous times, legally and, and undocumented. And now also as in the past with border patrol uh, figures, uh, there's a lot of double countings. There may be a, a young Salvadorian, 19 year old, he's apprehended, he's sent back because of remaining in Mexico or Title 42, and he may try again to a different part of the border and then he's counted again. So we have to be skeptical again. Nobody's making the, figure, the numbers on purpose, but there's a lot of double counting here of, of individuals. So, and then again, if we think about 200,000, let's say that they are all different individuals. They all wanna come and work here or study here. That's what most people uh, wanna do. Um, that is less than a third of the people that have, have just died of COVID. So uh, the marketplace can take them. Uh, David Card, the economist just won the Bank of Sweden prize, Nobel, the Nobel Prize for Economics. And he has demonstrated that more immigrants do not decrease the size of the pie because they produce more jobs, more employment. They don't decrease the uh, minimum wage. They are a, a net benefit for the whole population. And that applies whether it's Colombia, the US, Canada that we're talking about. That's why Canada, Australia have this point system to attract immigrants. So if you went to college in a different country, you have all these pluses, then they wanna uh, take advantage of that and, and, and have you move to Canada. As Paul, Paul was saying, the US doesn't need to attract people because people already wanna come here because there was a, a, a war that happened between the US and Mexico, that's where more, between the US and that country, that's where most immigrants come from and refugees because there's a strong uh, economic relationship um, or because they're already family ties because these people, most Central American people trying to come, they have their mother or father living in Houston or in Washington DC for 10, 20 years and they wanna live with them again. So they're not just randomly choosing countries. And even though they could apply to the point system in Canada, first, they don't wanna go there because their parents are here. And second, uh, the point system is very discriminatory, very classist in the Canadian example or the Australian example that it works really well for professionals like our, ourselves that have all these degrees and all this education and, and these things we will get the points and we'll get into. But already the US is a number one attractor of PhDs from India, China, Mexico, engineers. They're already coming. So we don't need to attract them with points. What the US needs, the structure of the American economy needs a lot of unemployed people that don't have the chance to go to the Atlantic University or American University and are gonna do these so-called low skill, low entry uh, jobs. Yeah. That's what we need more of. And that's where the Haitian, many of the Haitians and the Central Americans, some Afghanis fit perfectly that demand. So we can legislate it to create more work visas so that these people can come as workers which is what I want to do and what will be helpful for us right now. Let me, let me thank you for this, Ernesto. But let me uh, you know, ask the question also to our other uh, experts here. The, uh, some argue, if we, now we're going to go a little bit into the stratosphere of, uh, of policy and strategic objectives and where, what should we do? What is the ideal composition, let's say, of a, of a of new American immigration into the United States. You said correctly that many, many uh, talented people, uh, Ernesto, come to the United States anyway, and therefore you don't need uh, uh, you know, uh, incentives to, to attract them. The, P the people who come to get a PhD at Caltech or, or Stanford or wherever they go, or, or, or Georgia Tech, um, you know, they are talented people, usually most often from Asia, whether they're Indians or Chinese or Koreans, et cetera. However, we also know that it is not like they have a golden you know, path to immigration. Uh, many of them come and, and, try, and some struggle to once they finished their education, whether it's a master's degree or PhD, and they're really super qualified people, but it's not like they got a, a green card stamped, you know, uh, attached, clipped to their uh, degree, right? And so, and as we are in this global competition for talent, um, is this good enough or, or should the United States think about this more? Uh, you said the point system, and I'm sure you're right, is discriminatory because it really favors those who are good or higher edu or, or optimal education 
and he really does not favor those who have little or no education, but whose services and labor are still required in the American society. So my, my question is, uh, is, is a point system uh, a la Canada workable in the United States? And you know, ancillary to that, we do not really have, it seems to me, an up-to-date workers visa uh, program. In other words, for people who want to come here, not to stay forever, not to live here, but, but they're motivated by work, which sometimes can be seasonal. You know, we, we all remember the old Bracero programs. I guess this stuff goes back to the 1960s. But how are we doing on that? You know, let me get a specific question here. Do you think that if we had a robust, uh, clear, and enforceable uh, um, guest worker visa program, that that would alleviate the crisis at the border because many people uh, who are trying to cross illegally, what they really want is a job. And if a job is available to them through legal channels, they wouldn't need to do any of this. That's my layman's point of view, but I would like to hear from the experts. Do you think that that, to me, it seems like a simple common sense thing to do. And yet for some reason it's not done, at least not to the scale that I think the current, that our labor market would require. Elizabeth, mm -hmm. any thoughts on this? And Tatiana, I wanna hear from you too. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think that that's something that, that would help. And I think that um, there have been, um, you know, particularly in um, 1996, there were some changes to the immigration law that um, uh, took away some things and um, added some penalties that have really made it difficult for um, individuals who would otherwise benefit from um, either like a guest worker program or some kind of um, employment sponsorship. Up until um, right now, uh, and this, happens, you know, on a weekly basis, you know, we'll get contacted by someone and they'll say, you know, I have a, a landscaping company and I have this employee and he's fantastic. You know, my company would fall apart without him and, and um, you know, but unfortunately he's, he's undocumented and I would like to do whatever's possible to change that. And most times we have to say, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do. Um, you know, particularly if this is someone who, in, what we, we call entered without inspection, um, you know, entered the US without any, any kind of visa or anything and has been here for a period of time. Even if that person were to say, fine, I'll go back, I'll spend a little bit of time in my country if you want me to process there and go through, you know, background checks and whatnot, they're gonna be, penalize the second that they that they leave the US and they're not going to be able to return. Um, up until 2001, there was um, a piece of legislature that, that I'm sure everyone um, has heard of 245I that said um, someone in that situation um, that is willing to pay a fine the fact that they did enter without inspection, the fact that they have been out of status could be could be forgiven, and that was allowed to sunset in 2001. And and since then, um, you know, several people that could otherwise benefit from one of these, you know, employers or you know, sometimes uh, family members saying, you know, I do want to sponsor them, I do want to help them get legal status, you know, whatever the cost, whatever the steps, they would have um, an avenue and that that just hasn't, um, you know, that that's uh, really thrown up uh, a wall um, for a lot of people. Tatiana, let me ask you more, more, more pointedly, I mean, your focus is primarily on, do I understand correctly, children? Correct. Correct? Yes. So give us a sense, because many just may not understand exactly what this is all about. Why do why are we in this predicament right now? And of course, your organization and I'm sure there are others are trying to um, how can I say address this uh, um, adversity and try to make it humanely better uh, and and give a path to normalization to all, to to these uh, kids. But give us a sense how how this comes to be an issue 
And, and again, do you see any um, uh, legislative or regulatory changes going forward realistically? Not, I, mean, I know your, what your hopes are, <laughs> but, but realistically, as an, as an observer, you know, do you, is this going to get any better beyond the efforts of your organization and others? Right. So um, w one thing that we've been we've been doing is comparing um, the model that is here in the U.S. to efforts, um, you know, in Europe, especially because of our big operations uh, are in southern Spain. So one thing um, that is in concerning, as you might say, um, is that when the when a, when a, the company miners are in custody of the government, they're only expected to be um, with the services for about 30 days. After the 30 days, you get placed with the family and then um, that's kind of it, right? Then they have to figure the process of getting their paperwork in order, going to school, getting integrated into society, going through all those processes, which doesn't always happen. Uh, families might be afraid of going to a court. Even if, the, even if the child has a case, the fact that their sponsors might be undocumented, might say, okay, we got the kid. It's, it's in the house now. We're gonna kind of disappear, go off radar. And that is a problem because it's creating a longer term Pro, uh, a situation that the children might not be able to fix later. Mm -hmm. So having more, having friendlier policies, more support to the families that are receiving the children. Uh, one of the things that we're looking in our program is, find, is trying to find ways and trying to find funding to provide post-release services, which is something that they're not, it's not within the scope of work at this time from ORR. So, where do we find the resources? Who are the philanthropists that are willing to, to step up and let, you know, give us, give us the, the resources so our social workers could come with this child, could give them the rights, do it in their language. It might not be even in Spanish. You might need to do um, any indigenous language. Uh, tell them, hey, you have to enroll the kid. Here is the school. These are the services for health uh, healthcare. If you're older, and that, that is something that's also a distinction from our programs in Spain. If you're older, you graduate, you, if you don't know how, how, what do you need to graduate from high school? What do you need for a technical degree? You're in the limbo and you turn 18, you can be deported. Um, the programs that we have in Spain because legislation is different, we accompany the child through uh, like emancip emancipation. So. They are with us in the center. We provide education. Uh, we provide technical training. And this, as, so, as soon as they're getting close to age 17, 18, they already have a path to a job mm -hmm. and an independence. So um, our, our goal is to have them not only, uh, not only uh, bring them in as soon as they cross uh, whatever border they're coming from, but also give them an opportunity you know, give them that, that hope that they need, give them the tools so that they can become independent. And then we've had cases where uh, those kids that have gone and graduated out of our program come return and work for us either as translators or as uh, educators. So it's creating this ecosystem where we all support each other. Um, ideally in my, in my, uh, which uh, base case scenario, we would have dreamers come work for us. Dreamers that have become educators, they come, come work in our centers, uh, create these programs. Um, so, you know, build, build community in the long term. I think that's what we- uh, but Just go a little bit upstream if you wish. Uh, so to explain this to people who may not be familiar with the intricacies of this phenomenon, why are there so many unaccompanied children. Uh, why is it that children are sent across the border on their own by, I assume, their families? Is this an act of desperation of families that say things are so bad back home, if I, if I allow, if I 
figure out a way to get my child in the U.S., they may have a better better life. Is that it, or or, or are there other reasons that explain this phenomenon? You know, how, how do you view that? Because obviously, you see this every day. That question like gets me. <laughs> Go straight to my heart. Uh, these children are coming because of the situations in their country. There is not is not an easy trip. It's not something that they're willingly gonna you know get on the bestia, cross Mexico, find a coyote and cross the border. They're doing it out of desperation. They're doing it out of lack of opportunities. They're fleeing violence, uh, gangs, corruption. And I think um, the message from the administration was right into we need to provide the Northern Triangle with the resources to combat corruption, to combat gangs and drugs, the, the delivery was not the best, you know, saying don't come. No, we need to create, we need to invest in, in those countries, create opportunities so that they don't have to make the trip. A lot of them don't make it. A lot of them fall off or they get kidnapped. Uh, they're, they're, the stories are just heartbreaking. Another thing, and I imagine, uh, Ernesto, this is something you see a lot uh, that I have seen uh, this past two years, is the emergence of more uh, Latinx authors telling these kinds of stories. So I think it's uh, it's it's another step in, in in bringing that identity. I finished reading um, there's a book by Jenny Torres uh, Lopez. I think it's called We Are Not From Here, and it's. Uh, not sure if you're familiar with anybody. I highly recommend that book. It's the journey of three kids coming out of Guatemala, crossing and making it to the border. One of them gets detained, the other one doesn't. But uh, it's fiction and it's not. It's not. It's not based on a true story, but on the story of many. And it's written by a Guatemalan American author. So um, understanding and learning all those. Um, voices is good we have a unique opportunity again where our voices are being read more than before where our authors are coming out and telling the stories from a perspective of an immigrant from a perspective of a latinx um, and i think the more and more that we have this and the more and more that we bring those voices up we will understand why the kids are crossing why they are making this journey it's not uh, it, it might be a little different than, you know, from what we see in Europe. Um, the kids are sent by the family so that they can provide resources back home. Here we have kids that want to reunite with their parents, grandparents, uncles, uh, godparents, whoever they have here, because they're going to be able to provide them a better future than what they have in their country, if, yeah. if they make it to 18. Well, obviously, you're painting a not, how can I say, a very difficult and in some uh, measure heart rendering, uh, you know, environment, a picture that, that we, we understand. So we know, we're, we knew we we're going to solve this problem today, but Ernesto, give us your sense of, uh, at least in terms of some of the things we've been talking about today the dreamers and the millions of uh, undocumented workers who've been here, et cetera. Do you see realistically any chance to a path to legalization so that all these people, some of them know of no other country? You know, if, if I am a child and I came here from Guatemala or so whatever, and I was three years old when I was taken here, you know, and I lived all my life here and I went to school and I speak English. Maybe I don't even speak very good Spanish, you know, and, and whatever. And they tell me, no, you're an illegal immigrant. Yeah, you can't stay here. And you that's the only country you know. That's the case, right, of yeah. many, many people. And then there are all the others and there's no need to go through all the various uh, categories and subcategories. But do you see, Ernesto, from your scholarly, you know, expertise, and understanding of, of the politics in Washington, any chance whatsoever that between now and the end of Biden's first term, no, 2024, that there's gonna be any meaningful action that will provide a path to legalization, meaning not another Band-Aid, another extension, 
or, or provisional this or provisional that for the dreamers and bigger prize the millions of people who've been here for so many years. Do you see any, any hope for that? I see hope because it's a great question that you're asking. And in all honesty, right now, none of us knows the answer, which says that there is a possibility that it may happen. Likely won't, like in the past. But I think we're in a junction where things could happen if, if Congress wants them to. So let me just walk through that real quick. So as you were well saying, since the 2000s, there's no been real bipartisan attempts to do a comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, in the past, there was talks about that. Around 2001, supposedly there was a bipartisan agreement. It, so people say it fell down with uh, the events in 9-11. Since then, there have been promises by the Republicans, but no real bipartisan solution that will pass by both the Senate and, and, and the House. Uh, Obama deported a lot of people with the promise that there'll be a discussion of uh, doing an immigration reform and providing a pathway to legalization. That did not happen. And then with uh, Trump very openly anti-immigrant policies, I think it's clear to all of us that the Republican Party, the Republican representatives are not going to pass an immigration reform or be partners with that. A bipartisan bill will be great. Uh, business uh, interests from Facebook down to small businesses are in favor of uh, immigration reform. Uh, a lot of the constituents, a lot of the Republican voting citizens and independents are in favor of regularization of large amounts of people, but the Congress people are not in the Republican party. So they, this puts everything in the hands of the Democrats. And it was very, uh, all the Democrats banded together and decried the family separation, for example, the family separation policy of the Trump administration and the Republicans at the time of the ban on Muslims. It was an, a, a united voice against that. Now that they're in the house, in the White House, and they have a majority, slim majority, uh, they cannot honestly, sincerely blame the Republicans for impasse and inaction. So as, the, as Tatiana was saying earlier, uh, to me, the activists have become really mobilized and the Latino vote, the immigrant vote, which is an documented vote, which is Asian, uh, Indian, it's many, many constituencies. They will remember if uh, Biden, particularly the Congress, doesn't do anything to reconciliation. They know they cannot do away, away with the filibuster because of Manchin. Um, but then if, uh, and this is not really about numbers, the, uh, about cost, everything will be positive because immigrants pay taxes and generate wealth, if not adding to the 3.x million dollars. So that excuse cannot be used by cinema or Manchin uh, objectively. So if cinema wants to say that she's against immigration reform, she should say that out loud and she should be careful. And I think the fact that there's no more uh, Latino or immigrant origin or, or immigrant advocacy or lawyer voices in the media, they, we don't hear this point of view that often. But uh, remember that some years ago, there, was, there were these laws in, in Arizona, show me your papers, declared unconstitutional. And since then, the, 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 the state has become more and more democratic. Same with Nevada, same happened with California with Proposition 187. So cinema has to be careful not to antagonize the, the Latino and the immigrant votes in Arizona, because she, she also has to be worried about them, not only about the Republicans and independents. So that's what we, that has to be part of her calculation. And Manchin too, in order for the Biden coalition to sustain, they need the, the foreign born, the immigrant and the minority vote, and they know it. So people are putting pressure, there's protests in, in Washington all the time, but uh, a lot can be due to reconciliation to do not only the dreamers, doing the dreamers as a compromise will be a big mistake because that's an easy uh, low hanging fruit. That's easy to pass, that should be bipartisan. If we give that away, then it'd be very, very hard to get others. So at least it should be uh, the DREAMers, the TPS, um, essential workers during the pandemic. So we are around 7 million people around that. And reform asylum and refugees, so it becomes more generous and more open-ended. Uh, it's a political fight, but that's what Congress is here for. And they have to, to, to feel the pressure for the constituents, for people here. Hopefully staffers can hear the different point of view. The US needs more workers or we're gonna be in a financial crisis five years from now. Immigration is the only way to do it right now. Uh, so it's up to us what future we want. That's what politics is about making decisions. 
And the Democratic Party shouldn't be afraid of being called weak on immigration or fall to this trap that the border is in crisis. It's not. If a lot of people come to one entry point at the same time, there's going to be traffic. We know that from 395. But if a lot of doors are open, there's a lot of pathways to drive to home, then the traffic is going to divert and then we can get home faster for dinner. So I hope uh, Congress people are very practical, pragmatical and political and support uh, this agenda, which doesn't add to the deficit. I, thank you. I guess we're really getting very close to the end of our time, and I'm sorry we couldn't really uh, go deeper into all these issues. But to your point, my my, my word of caution here, and I'm, I, you know, I don't want to be the, the resident pessimist here, but uh, you know, everything that looks like uh, common sense to all of you practitioners and, and knowledgeable, you know, then the other side says, "Oh, that's amnesty. We don't want amnesty." That's bad. Amnesty is bad because it encourages more illegal immigrants to come. And as we know, even considering the horribly anti-immigrant policies of the Trump administration, lo and behold, the, the, between 2016 and 2020, Mr. Trump increased substantially you know, the percentages of Latino voters in the United States, which, which you would say, this makes no sense, right? It's, why, why are they doing this? Well, I don't have the answer. I'm just noticing the phenomenon, which is unmistakable, which tells me that, there, that this uh, picture is uh, complicated, <laughs> okay? So I am sorry that we cannot provide uh, the blueprint for, you know, uh, the action plan for immigration reform, but I'm really grateful to all of you for your contributions and insights. And even though this will continue to be a complicated issue, perhaps we can revisit this at some point to see if any progress indeed, according to the lines that all of you are hoping has been made. And yes, the conclusion is this is a country of immigrants. For whatever is worth, I'm one of them. And, um, and, uh, and that's the way it's going to be. The question is to deal with this phenomenon in, in, in a good, humane, and, prag and also, as you say, Ernesto, pragmatic. You know, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, we need immigrants. And, uh, and uh, the question is how to regularize the flow and to, as you pointed out, not have one entry point with uh, traffic jams, but spread it out and make it better better managed. So on that note, uh, to all our panelists, many thanks indeed for being with us today. And I'm sure we'll have you back because we'll have to talk about this again. This is not going to go away. So good luck to you in all your endeavors. Uh, Tatiana, you're doing great work. We really appreciate partnering with you and the possibility to be at, le at least a little bit part of the solution here, as opposed to being part of the problem. Elizabeth, I know you're trying to do your best helping clients and, and, uh, and Ernesto, good luck with your research and work and I'm sure we'll see each other very soon. All right. Thank so you so thank much. You. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks thank for you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, to all the uh, uh, people who are kind enough to uh, enroll in this webinar and follow us. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.